evolution development biology is a, an old and new science at the same time. It began in the second half of the 19th century, during the time of Darwin, when he was active as well, when embryologists in Western Europe were studying uh, development biology of many species of organisms and trying to figure out how they developed from the egg to, to adult. It became very apparent then that understanding of developmental biology would be actually quite important and relevant to understanding of evolution. Darwin himself was quite curious about uh, development biology or embryology as it was called at the time. For example, um, one of the areas where he became especially proficient was uh, studying barnacles. Barnacles are crustaceans which are very mollusk-like. In fact, they were categorized as mollusks by famous French anatomist Cuvier because they were sessile, they're immobile, they uh, filter feed, they have uh, the overall appearance of mollusks. And uh, it was the biologist who actually discovered that uh, the way how the life of barnacle began was as a larvae, which was essentially a crustacean larvae, very similar to those of shrimp and lobsters and crabs and many other crustaceans. So it was shown during the time of Darwin that uh, the evolutionary origin of barnacles must have been as crustaceans, and they became mollusk-like because of particular adaptations that they evolved over time. So this was one of the first evolution developmental stories, or what we call evo devo stories um, in biology. But really, it was in the last uh, 10 or 15 years when evo devo became much more prominent, because um, for about a century, these two sciences, developmental genetics, and evolutionary biology, biology were uh, following their own very distinct paths. So evolutionary biology focused on fossils, they focused on population genetics, they focused on how um, genetic variation, for example, changed within the population at, and the like. Whereas developmental genetics, um, geneticists, they mostly focused on a few model organisms, such as Drosophila, mouse, and a few others where they began to figure out the details of how organisms are put together, how information from genes is passed onto the cells, how cells um, are organized into tissues, and how tissues are organized into organs, and how, again, an organism is built together. So these two sciences were largely apart for almost a century, and only now they're coming back together when breakthroughs in development genetics, our, the, the genes which we know um, about, which are necessary to put an embryo together and better understanding of evolution, such as phylogenies, the, uh, the relationship between different species. Uh, the reason why uh, this time is particularly important is because we have, again, breakthroughs in both development biology and evolutionary biology, and we can use those very synergistically. That is, we can understand and compare development of key species, such as, again, mouse or Drosophila or C. elegans or zebrafish, by understanding their evolutionary relationships much better. At the same time, we can understand evolutionary processes, very important evolutionary processes, far better when we understand how the organisms which we compare are actually, again, are put together from a bioengineering perspective, from perspective of development biology. There are many examples currently where some rather uh, precise mechanisms, genetic mechanisms, have been um, discovered that explain important uh, evolutionary transitions on both micro level and macro level. Some of the first principles of development biology were actually laid down uh, in the 19th century. As I mentioned, uh, during the time of Darwin, when he was working his evolutionary theory and his colleagues were working evolutionary theory, there were many very important uh, development biologists who were studying embryos of uh, different species and were trying to figure out main principles, how uh, they actually develop. So one of these people is um, Carl von Baer, and von Baer was a Prussian scientist. He actually studied in uh, he he studied in Bavaria. He did his research in Prussia in uh, what was called Königsberg. Um, he and his friends um, from this uh, universities were actually quite instrumental to understanding the principles of development. He formulated some of the first laws, what are called uh, biogenic laws of von Baer where he, again, uh, discovered principles of how embryos are developing. For example, he was the first person who showed that embryos do, do not develop from homunculus. Um, before him, it was believed that if you actually look down into an egg, uh, 
of a, a of a chicken or a human, you can actually find a miniature adult. And what happens is that this tiny little chicken, a tiny little human, grows and sort of Russian doll style. You have this infinite number of individuals which are inside each other, and all they do is just grow. So he very clearly showed that when embryo begins to develop, it develops from scratch. It develops from something he called germ layers, uh, three germ layers, uh, the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm, which give rise to all the tissues and all the organs of the future adult. So ectoderm gives rise to the nervous tissue and the, ec and the epithelium. Mesoderm gives rise to all the skeletal structures and the musculature in the body, and endoderm gives rise to the gut tissues and many of the glands around the body. So those are the really the uh, foundations of um, uh, of development biology. He also, um, from his comparisons of embryos which belong to animals from different um, levels of organization, some simple animals uh, such as worms and to more complex ones, including uh, vertebrates, including humans, he uh, realized that there was actually a lot of parallel how embryos developed, that is, from simple to complex, and how the um, adults were arranged in kind of this uh, scale of being from simple to complex. And so the second and third laws that he formulated are actually talking about this. He specifically talks about the relationship between development, um, the, because if you think about it, these processes of evolution and, and, and uh, of, large, of, of the um, phylogenesis and ontogenesis, the process of uh, building of an individual organism, are similar. That is, uh, when an embryo begins to develop, it begins from a single cell, a single uh, diploid cell, which then develops into a more and more complex looking um, creature. If you think about developing of a chicken, for example, what happens first is that a, an egg, uh, a single cell, divides into more cells, and then, so they eventually they give rise to a small worm-like creature, which has a primitive internal skeleton called notochord, and it has blocks of musculature, uh, segmented musculature, called myomeres, or somites. And then this embryo then develops into uh, a creature which, which has four limbs, uh, four limbs and high limbs, uh, two pairs of limbs, a head and a tail. So it goes through this tetrapod condition, then it develops uh, reptilian features. Um, eventually, it will develop feathers. It will develop a beak. It will develop um, bipedal posture. So it will develop wings versus legs. And eventually, it will develop what we call a modern bird, a very complex organism made of billions of cells with particular morphology and behavior. And again, something very similar happens during evolution of this organism. If you trace evolution of a bird, uh, ultimately, it, it uh, evolves from a single cell, a single diploid, uh, single animal diploid cell, and um, single cellular animals are still around. They're called protozoans, and one of those protozoans give rise to all the multicellular animals. So you, you uh, evolve a multicellular animal, which evolves into something that looks like a lancelet, a small worm-like creature with a notochord, internal skeleton, and blocks of muscles called myomeres around it. Then this um, lancelet-like animal evolves into a more complex tetrapod. Uh, animal, which has two pairs of limbs, four limbs and high limbs, a head and a tail, something that looks like a primitive amphibian, for example, like a salamander. And then this animal evolves into a reptile with reptilian features. Uh, a reptile evolves into a dinosaur, a bipedal reptile, with scales and eventually with feathers. Uh, then snout turns into a beak, um, the tail shortens, and eventually you have a modern bird, um, a complex organism made of billions of cells, with particular morphology and behavior. So both processes, development of a bird and evolution of a bird, follow largely parallel courses. And therefore, um, the hope is and the expectation is that by understanding what's happening during development of a bird, you can understand what happened during evolution of a bird and, and vice versa. By studying the evolutionary past of the bird lineage, we can probably interpret the events which happened during its development much more clearly. So that's the premise, that's the foundation of this science, and we're uh, hoping to both understand the relationship between ontogenesis and phylogenesis, evolution and development, and use this uh, knowledge of this connection to better explain both processes. Perhaps some of the most exciting questions for evolution development biology, or EVDIVO, are figuring out both specific mechanisms of how particular evolution transitions took place, and we're talking about both microevolution, changes, uh, very highly adaptive changes between species, 
but also at macro level, how you generate very different looking types of animals in the first place. But also um, figuring out the principles uh, which relate development and evolution, because if we understand those, we can probably uh, begin to fill in, even uh, have some predictive power to, um, to expect certain missing links which are not in place, but we can probably um, guess their existence by understanding how, again, animals develop and evolve. The fossil record is very incomplete, it's very imperfect. We get new, interesting, exciting fossils um, all the time, and in the future, no doubt, more will, will be found. But we're also at the point now where understanding of both development and evolution can actually give us some interesting predictive powers to, to even say what animals are yet to be discovered in the fossil record, which will bridge the already existing uh, uh, lineages that we know about, for example, uh, during the origin of um, unusual types of organisms, such as birds. Um, there are some gaps still present, but already from our uh, information with, with that uh, we learned about development of these uh, animals, we can predict what missing links, again, were indeed present and are yet to be discovered.